Hi, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, welcome you uh, to this uh, video uh, uh, about Remote Communities. Uh, Remote Communities is a great company, a subsidiary of Hydro One Inc., but a really great entity on its own. The true benefits from the remote communities is, is that they truly have bonded uh, with the communities in which they serve and they do a great job of uh, providing generation, distribution, customer service and, and, and the billing that goes along with it. Hydro One Remote Communities is unique in, in several ways. Um, certainly the uh, logistic challenges that come into play with, uh, with the delivering of electricity and, and to the northern parts of the communities, uh, northern parts of Ontario where uh, most of them are fly in with no uh, year-round road access uh, has its challenges uh, throughout the year and uh, certainly dictates how we run our business to a large extent. Uh, having to get fuel in on winter roads and fly it in during the summer to accommodate the generation and uh, plan for um, service upgrades and delivering poles on the winter roads and planning far enough out in advance to facilitate that is uh, in your mind all the time when you're, when you're planning how you do jobs. We don't have service trucks. We uh, use uh, chartered aircraft to, to go to work in the morning and, and to respond to trouble calls. We're basically an island if you, if you look at the generation and distribution systems and so uh, in an integrated utility so we generate the power that, that feeds all the customers within the community. There's no ability to get it from any other source. You never know what you're going to see when you get off the plane. Your expectation of what you're going to see when you get there is uh, probably uh, not what you are going to see. The Hydro One Remotes was established with dedicated staff to service the north and I'm talking about the remote north. Everyone there was hired specifically because they wanted to be there. Yeah, we were looking to see if they were crazy enough to take this on, eh? Like the rest of us that were in it. <laughs> this is pretty different, okay? The fuel was your biggest bill, okay? Like the, I could tell you about the original specs, no turbocharged engines, blah, blah, blah. Uh, all inefficient stuff, okay? And the maintenance guys, it's like, Lauren, why are you buying these things with turbochargers and that on them? I mean, they don't last as long. We want some old low RPM thing. That, I'll tell you why. Because uh, the fuel costs a ton of money, right? And they're inefficient as hell. We're here hauling bulk fuel. Uh, this airplane can serve several functions, and this one is one of them. We haul uh, somewhere between 6,000 and 7,000 liters of fuel uh, at a time. It takes about uh, 20 minutes to 25 minutes to be able to uh, pump off that much fuel and uh, we're set up to be environmentally friendly, we're efficient and uh, we can do about uh, probably about 24,000 liters in a day. Uh, this is our computer room here where we monitor what's going on in the north. All of our sites have a computerized system where it downloads data in real time and at night for data files and uh, we can use this system here to troubleshoot and see what's going on in real time at the plants. Uh, the screen that you see here right now is called our overview screen and it shows that we have three diesel generators, which one's running and online and the main breaker that shows the power is getting out to our communities. We're able to monitor frequency, voltage and about 27 different plant alarms that can come in at any time. Uh, we use this extensively to help communicate back and forth with the operators and troubleshoot here. We also burn millions and millions of liters of diesel fuel in a year, so it's very important for us to be able to monitor the fuel. Lumber and the housing and the, uh, has to be uh, rely on the uh, winter system, which is a very short the, uh, on each, each any given year. Yeah, mostly the uh, the winter roads are uh, good for uh, two to three weeks and uh, depends on the weather and the ice condition and the snow. This is uh, one of the spots where Webequay will bring in uh, their freight for the winter road. 
Uh, right now it's, it's the river behind us, but in the winter time this is all frozen and all the trucks will come through here with their supplies, again for their houses and uh, anything else that's going on in, in, the, in the community. Collections was always a challenge in remote communities. I mean, there were good paying communities that never seemed to be in arrears, and there were other communities that were in trouble all the time. And most folks, they don't have bank accounts. It's pretty much cash, isn't it? As a percentile, I would say that remote communities have a higher percentile of arrears than most grid connected communities. I used to go into those communities, and you'd go to the, the dump, and you'd see hundreds upon hundreds of hot water tanks. They would cut them out because they couldn't afford to pay. The, uh, the most challenging thing up north here is uh, the, the cost of uh, the day-to-day -day living. Uh, the cost of living is very high. Uh, that's because of, uh, we have to air freight uh, whatever we need into the community. Fuel, food, I mean, uh, a two liter of uh, milk uh, you know, costs about uh, like eight dollars as opposed to uh, let's say three or four dollars. Just day-to-day -day cost of, uh, of living is, is, is very challenging, you know. Well, you know, challenges um, that we face, pretty obvious. I mean, isolation alone, everything you get got to be handled three or four times to get it in. The prices we pay to get this stuff put on a plane bus truck to a location where there's a facility to put it on a plane. It's just uh, causes pricing to really escalate. Well, comparing prices in Webequay to Thunder Bay, there's really no comparison. I mean, Thunder Bay, you got a supermarket where the tractor trailer basically comes from the supplier, unloads at their back door. And here, we got to find a focal point. The supplier got to ship it to the focal point. Then that has to be shipped to an airline and then put on a plane. Indian Northern Affairs Canada supply the, the capital for the, uh, for the upgrades to meet the uh, generation needs of the community. Uh, so sometimes when we're uh, uh, in a situation where uh, we're getting close to the capacity of those generating stations, there's uh, a need to uh, limit uh, connections uh, based on there's just not enough generation capacity available. So that, that's something that you don't see very, um, very often in the rest of the province. Yeah, we do have a uh, actually, the housing crisis uh, from time to time, and uh, because we can't uh, bring in any bring in any additional housing in the, in the community because of the uh, limited capacity to the hydro hydro system, we can't do any uh, hookups uh, until the uh, the upgrade the, uh, is done. We just continue to build houses, whether we connect them to the distribution system or not. We, you know, I mean, people need a place to stay. Uh, but it, it's challenging if, if we don't have that generation to, to, to connect. Because the uh, First Nation supplies the housing to the residents, uh, the community members, if they get a house and it happens to be in another area of town that they particularly don't want to live, they want to live closer to their, their church, their family, their friends, they'll quite often move the house. So we have people to go to site expecting to find a house in one location and find it somewhere else. Obviously, it's a quality of life issue in the sense that if you provide electricity to a complete community, you're enhancing not only their opportunities to uh, view the outside world through television and whatnot that they may not have had, but over and beyond that, it was really a health issue as well in that they were then presented with an opportunity to have clean water as opposed to going out into the lakes and bring it in by a pail. I remember I remember when we used to have electricity just for the teachers and the schools at that time. I, I remember when you used to have uh, those small little generators for each individual home to power, you know, for, for lighting and, and and, and stuff like that, <laughs> yeah. So I guess I would say within the last uh, five, seven years, uh, the service has been really good. Hi, my name is Dan Santer. I'm the director of Hydro One Remotes. I hope this video has helped you understand our business just a little better. 
Our challenges are well documented. I'd like to talk about our successes and the people responsible for these successes. For example, our staff's work with the First Nations, the chiefs and councils and communities. We've managed to bring our arrears to the lowest levels in our history. The staff have also done a great job in preparing for the 2011 winter road season. The planning, logistics, resulted in one of our best years in getting fuel, building materials and work equipment to remote sites. For example, the winter road fuel delivery equates to about a million dollars in savings. There are many great things happening at Hydro One Remotes. In closing, I'd like to thank all the Hydro One Remote staff for their contribution and dedication to the business, which contributes greatly to our overall success.